Well, we are hearing a wonderful conversation with somebody talking to their kids. I might just um, uh, start if I could just ask everybody um, to put themselves on mute. That would be awesome. And um, we might start with our cameras off. And as I invite the speakers to come up to the virtual podium, I'll ask them to turn their mics and their, um, and their cameras uh, back on. Um, so we will get underway. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start with an acknowledgement of country, and that is paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land in which we are meeting today. Um, I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and offer a very warm welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friends with us today, and a warm welcome to you, our members, our speakers, um, and our special guests. Um, in a world of online events, we really appreciate this time that you've taken to be with us uh, today. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, a special acknowledgement of all of those people who find themselves in lockdown. This is a very trying and frustrating period, um, but we are here to support you. Um, so thank you um, uh, for being here. You know, over the last uh, few months, there's been um, a lot of discussion and a lot of global conversations that I'm part of. And, uh, the, you know, the theme has been around collaboration. And, you know, I couldn't agree more about how important um, collaboration is. But what is equally important is that this is sustainable and that is action-based collaboration, in particular around our favourite topic of RegTech, and that's why uh, we are here today. Um, what the RegTech Association has achieved with the help and support of our members and the ecosystem in general is to surface the conversations and the education uh, like we are doing um, this afternoon. So thank you all. In this virtual mode, sometimes it is a little bit hard to know who's online and what the engagement um, looks like. So I'd like to practice what we preach when um, we always talk about a single source of truth and the importance of contemporary data in real time. So I thought I'd give you some real time numbers um, that underline who's um, with us today, who's registered. Since we started this program four years ago, it was originally known as RegTech in the Bag, and it was named after the brown bag lunches that we used to serve. Um, that was before a pandemic got in the way and you could actually serve a brown bag um, lunch. And it was an event in Sydney with 80 people that sold out with standing room only and, and people, like very senior people sitting on bean bags. It was hilarious. But actually, from that um, event four years ago, uh, this event today has attracted 340 registrations from 24 different countries, including a very large group of regulators. There are 20 regulators um, on the line from Australia, from Canada, from the UK, from UAE and from China. We actually also significantly have more regulated or reporting entities um, online today uh, than reg tech companies. In fact, 7% more buyers than sellers. So this is indicating a clear shift. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, some other people, special people that are on the line, and that is our affiliate, um, our affiliate uh, organisations, other associations from around the world. We've got a number of those online from across Australia, from Canada and the Nordics. Um, welcome um, to you as well. To date, um, so far this year, we've had 3,000 people from 50 countries um, attend these programs. Thank you. It's with this global voice that we can really continue to accelerate um, adoption of RegTech. And I'd encourage you today um, in the session, get involved, ask questions of the presenters. I'm going to go through a little bit of housekeeping on how you can do that in a second, uh, but we'll make this an interactive and a richer experience if you do get involved and ask those burning questions. So Hong, if I could ask you to move along. Thank you. Housekeeping. So if I could ask, ask anybody to be on be on. And also to turn your camera off. Uh, that would be awesome. And I will invite the speakers as they come up to the virtual podium to turn their cameras uh, back on. Thank you. We will be recording this session and it's going to be sent to you afterwards. And we're also, for the first time, going to be doing some satisfaction polling uh, throughout the event. So if you see a poll pop up, please, by all means, um, complete that because that feedback's really important to us. Um, next slide. Thank you, Hong. So on the 
agenda for this first part of the program is I'm going to be uh, touching on all of those bullet points on that slide and in the um, uh, to preserve time, I'm not going to go through them all, so we'll just march um, straight into it. Thank you, Hong. So what is RegTech? RegTech is short for Regulatory Technology, and it's uh, the application of emerging technologies to improve the way businesses manage regulation and compliance. But what is really super exciting about this is that RegTech is really emerging as this range of super tools that can solve challenges for all industries everywhere. So not just in financial services, and whilst that is the theme today, certainly, um, this, um, this can be applied across many other industries. Uh, thank you, Hong. Next slide. But I want to start here by talking about trust and why I believe uh, that RegTech supports this building of trust. As consumers, and we are all consumers, we deserve trust. Every interaction that we have with our bank, with our energy company, with our telco, our law firm, our industry association, and in our business relationships, there is a presumption that trust is present. And technology really needs to underscore this trust. And I believe that RegTech can help build this as a standard. Thank you, Hong. Next, um, next slide. So what does RegTech bring? Well, it, it does bring these things, productivity, efficiency, lowering of the costs and, and increased safety and confidence of the system. You know, I attended um, a, a global RegTech event last night and these uh, very features of RegTech were discussed at, at length by a regulator, a bank and a consulting firm who were universally, as I am, in agreement that RegTech can bring these things to an organisation. But uh, one of the insights was people just need to start. And by coming here today, it's a sign that you've either started or that you are on this journey. So welcome to it. But my call out on this point is as well to ask you, if you're a regulated entity or you're an other form of RegTech beneficiary here today, are you equipping your people with the very best ground breaking tools to surface the risks, manage the data, help people in your organisation make better business decisions, report more accurately and in real time? And, and that's a question that I'll leave um, with everybody that is on the line today. Um, thank you, Hong. So what's the burning platform? Well, you can see the numbers on this slide. Total compliance spending by financial institutions, 287 billion. Regulatory fines for financial institutions, you know, 14.2 billion. Um, we're just collecting some data from our members right now. And one of the early um, indicators are from this latest data collection. It's showing that one of the other drivers is actually regulated entities are very much responding to customer and consumer demand. So this is a significant driver and a burning platform for them right now as well. Thank you, Hong. Next, um, next slide. So on this slide, it's actually just outlining some of the reasons why RegTech is so critical for regulated entities. And we're actually going to talk about why RegTech is critical for regulators um, once I've finished uh, this session with, with APRA. But for now, around, you know, regulated entities, I've just talked about compliance and the cost increasing, talked about the regulatory fines. Um, RegTech can obviously help you meet those things, but you know, the, the point I made earlier, it, it's actually providing you with great tools to monitor and oversee, you know, your risk. Um, give your boards and your management teams greater transparency with real-time information that can lead to that efficiency and productivity uh, that we're striving for and that assists to deliver superior outcomes for customers and shareholders and consumers ultimately uh, bringing that trust. Uh, thank you, Hong. Um, so what is RegTech? Well, I thought I'd start with this um, with this taxonomy that we um, have uh, co-developed. 
because one of the things that's really important, if we accept that RegTech is actually just not something that belongs to, uh, or RegTech, uh, the solutions don't belong to one country, they're actually global solutions. It's really important that we have a global language. And at the association, our whole RegTech universe is built around this taxonomy. And we think that this global language is so critical so that RegTech can be well understood by everyone. And so what you can see here is we have uh, two ways, um, we, we have two buckets, if you like, as part of the taxonomy. In fact, there are more than these two buckets, but this slide is just outlining uh, these two. One is the identification of risks, and then also what is the functional role of the reg tech. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting, and it just got added today, at the bottom of that right-hand column there is something called workforce risk management. So this is something that's just emerged and we've had a number of organisations join the association over the last month or so that work in the space of workforce risk management. So as uh, teams have pivoted um, to working remotely, but also as organisations are looking for um, more efficient ways to onboard staff, manage uh, manage their time, uh, manage their, um, especially if they're related to awards and industrial relations, how to manage that whole uh, mapping of regulations um, to execution. Um, I thought I'd just call it out because I think that this is a really exciting and growing area. And not only that, it can apply to any businesses, small, medium or large, um, outside of um, financial services, but could include financial services. So overall, this taxonomy is the basis by which we uh, talk about everything and how we uh, collect our research from our stakeholders. So a little bit more about our uh, next slide. Thank you, Hong. Little bit um, about uh, uh, what RegTech is. We see this as an enabler and an accelerator rather than a disruptor. The only thing that we think good RegTech disrupts is actually a bad process. Um, reg techs are usually founded by ex-industry practitioners, um, which means that what you will find by and large in the reg tech community is a range of um, mature um, individuals who understand the risks and understand about business relationships. And I've already talked about how it can be sector agnostic in terms of how it is applied to many, many different industries. And RegTech is also technology agnostic. So we have a number of different technologies that are used within our RegTech solutions that might include things like um, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, a blockchain, et cetera. You may also hear the term SubTech, and maybe that's going to come up in the uh, discussion today, as well as the term RegTech. And we um, at the association regard those as pretty much the same thing, just with a different um, use case. Thank you, Hong. So here is who is in the RegTech ecosystem and many of these organisations are on the line uh, today. Uh, RegTechs, regulated entities, of course, the regulators, uh, government, uh, tech firms, startup accelerators and incubators, science and research organisations, the media, of course, and I mentioned earlier, our allied affiliate industry uh, bodies. Thank you very much, Hong. So what might surprise uh, some people on the line today um, is that Australia is actually the third largest reg tech hub in the world. Um, this was a piece of research that we did with Boston Consulting Group last year. And so you can see uh, the numbers there. It's probably actually changed a little bit since then and I think probably um, gone, up a, uh, gone up a fraction, but I, I think we're probably uh, still in third place. However, I would say that there's some other jurisdictions that are also building their reg tech uh, capabilities. So we may not enjoy that place uh, for very long. Um, next slide, thank you, Hong. Um, so this actually also points uh, to a very important point. Um, I was, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, an event I was at last night and BCG was speaking at that and said that so far this year, so we're, you know, seven months into this year and $2.2 billion so far has been invested globally into RegTech and we need to make sure that that good money is actually flowing through to all RegTechs everywhere. And you can see on this slide that Australia, um, as, as an example, is uh, well down the list and so we need to work on improving um, that. Thank you, Hong. Next slide. 
Last but not least, and I won't go through all of the detail on this slide, but we've all got a role to play. Everyone on this webinar today has a role to play in the growth of RegTech. Investors, buyers, regulators, policymakers, uh, technologists. It takes a village to make this happen. Uh, next slide, thank you, Hong. Um, if you're not aware, I, once again, I won't go through all of the things on this slide, but our association was founded in 2017 as a non-profit. We now have 180 organisational members and it was really formed to actually help exactly what we're doing today. It was formed to help collaboration. It was formed to help regulators, regulated entities and reg techs um, have a natural place to come together to do exactly what we're doing today. So this sits uh, right in our uh, sweet spot. Really in a nutshell, we're here to fast track adoption and to create a global centre of excellence. Um, thank you, Hong. More specifically, um, these are the four strategies for the association. Um, focus really for us is on advocating for the value of RegTech, helping our members explore and expand into new markets and look at export opportunities, and uh, last but not least, to facilitate investment and, of course, um, help people try and navigate uh, through this um, pandemic. Uh, thanks. Uh, and here is the, um, this is the list of members as at the 30th of June, 180 um, organisations that are very proud uh, part of the association. So I'm going to pause there and I'm happy to take questions right at the other end of the presentations, but I'm anxious that we um, move along um, and invite our guest speakers. So we're, we're going to have a, a presentation from APRA right now. And then what we're going to have is actually two presentations from two of our RegTech companies who are going to help put some of this stuff that I've been talking about into a bit of perspective and a bit and 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 present some practical uh, case studies. And then we'll end with a Q&A at the end and then I'll stay on for a little while longer if people um, want to um, stop by and say hi. So I think that that's the end of mine and I'm going to now hand to APRA. Uh, we have Doug and Melisande on the line. Welcome uh, to both of you. I invite you to turn your camera on on your mics. Um, and I'm now going to hand to you. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Deb. And it's always a pleasure to um, work with the RegTech Association. I think you do a great job and um, it's a really important area. I particularly liked your presentation just before, um, Deb, where you were talking about, you know, productivity, efficiency, safety, confidence. Um, I had something that I was going to say, which was more in the language of our mandate which is efficiency, competition, safety, et cetera. It's all the same sort of stuff and what's not there to like for, from a regulatory perspective. Indeed. Um, Indeed. <laughs> so, um, you know, really appreciate that. As I said, today we ha have um, Doug, who is looking after a specific project at APRA, which we think is going to help facilitate some things. So I will hand over to him and he will do some, uh, most of the talking today. But if there's any broader questions, I'm here to assist as well. Okay, thanks very much, Sam, and thanks, Deb. Okay, so hello, everyone. My name is Doug Jenkins. I'm a general manager at APRA, and it's my pleasure at the moment to be looking after a project called APRA Connect, which we'll take you through today. So we've got some slides, but just before we start going through the slides, um, three key points. First of all, um, it is that APRA is implementing a new data collections platform, and that's called APRA Connect. And this is a platform which will eventually replace our existing D2A platform, if you've heard of that one before. So that's the first thing, our new system, APRA Connect. Second thing, and really why we're here today, is that this will be the first time that APRA has been able to provide direct access to the system. And so that is that RegTechs are able to have ongoing access to the test system to help you de de uh, develop your products. And then look, the third thing I'll say up front is that most of the material, actually I think all the material that you'll be seeing this afternoon, uh, it's available on our website. So certainly that's as simple as apra.gov.au. And if you go into the data statistics area, there's an area on um, getting ready for APRA Connect. There's a technical um, information section, and that has an area for spe especially for RegTechs. And as I say, most of the information that we'll be talking through today uh, is on that website. 
Okay, but certainly um, it won't be just me today. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues, Daniel Hunt, who's the business lead for the project, Andre Koronoff, uh, who runs APRA's data operations team, and also Jane Code, our project readiness lead as well. Um, hi, hi, Andre, and uh, yeah, thanks for joining me, guys. Okay, so uh, to get it started, um, a bit more on what is APRA Connect. So as I said before, it's a data collection platform, uh, which is pretty much, that's the way that financial entities uh, can get the data that APRA requires for collections so that we can understand what's happening in those entities. And look, that happens in a number of ways, either entities directly upload information into the system. Many entities have trustees or um, agencies that they go through. And then certainly also there are reg tech systems involved in that ecosystem as well. Okay, the way that we're doing it is that we're rolling out the new platform. It's on track to go live in September of this year, and we'll be initially including a limited number of collections on the new platform. Okay, those are collections, actually Hong, just hold a moment, uh, thanks. Uh, but those, those collections are, are in the superannuation and the PHI space, um, and also around entity management. Okay, so I will um, emphasize that the D2A, the existing system, that will remain in place initially um, and will transition collections, or especially will re-implement collections onto the new platform over time. Okay, so briefly, the way, reasons why we're doing it is that the new system, it's easier to use than the old system, which had quite an archaic architecture behind it. Um, we think that both for APRA and also entities and also RegTex, there's going to be less ongoing maintenance required. Um, it's a web-based system as opposed to the other client um, install requiring system. Uh, we think uh, we've got good confidence that the system is very adaptable to future needs. And this is both on, from a regulator point of view, but also from the entity point of view. And this is especially around the flexibility of collections, how frequently we'll be collecting, what type of data we'll be collecting. And that's especially when we start talking about fit for purpose collection design. That's where a catch cry that we are certainly working on is getting more granular data collections um, in place. So Hong, now if we go on. Thanks, next slide, yep, yeah, great. Okay, so this is our implementation timeline. Um, for those of you who have been keeping track, you'll know this project has been going for a while. Uh, we did pause the project last March due to COVID. We recommenced in December last year. And uh, since then, we started with a very limited pilot in April of this year that we saw was successful. That allowed us to go to a general external test where now all our, uh, regulated entities have are invited to come on and familiarise themselves with the system. And as I said before, we're aiming for a go live in September, again, for limited collections in the superannuation space, PHI, and to allow entities to update their entity management piece. Um, and then on this slide, you'll see that we've also got a section for future releases, um, and that will be for future collections, um, including, of course, across all industries. So Hong, if we go on to the next slide, thanks. Okay, so um, what? So where we're up to with the project, as I mentioned briefly before, is that uh, we now have an external test environment, which is available to all entities and also RegTex. Get onto that in a moment. That's been available for uh, almost a month now, from the 17th of June, and the aim of this is really to allow entities to start familiarising themselves with the feature features of the system, um, working out how they can onboard themselves onto the system, and certainly working out their own processes to gather and collect and format the data ready for collection into APRA. Okay, so we'll go on to the next slide now. Thanks. Um, so looking at what this means for each industry, um, we've already covered that for superannuation and PHI, um, it does mean new collections. Um, and so, and so uh, those entities are being well and truly taken through that process. But then for all entities, it also allows them to update their own in entity information within the system. So removing some of the manual processes involved at the moment. So just emphasize again, that look, yeah, it means that for non-PHI, um, non-superannuation, uh, so especially talking about ADIs and those sorts of um, entities, uh, there aren't any new collections at the moment apart from that entity management piece, but the platform will be taking on more collections for them in the future. So thanks, Hong. If we go on to the next slide. 
Okay, so this is where I'll go into a bit more detail, but this is around about RegTechs having access to the APRA-Connect test environment. Okay, so in brief, um, previously, if RegTechs wanted to get access to an APRA data collections platform, so the old D2A system, uh, they would be they would have to partner up with a financial entity and basically work with that entity to get access into test environments. Okay, so as part of this system, the APRA Connect system, we're now allowing RegTex to get direct access into that test environment. That that's on an ongoing basis. So even though before I mentioned that we went live with the test environment in June, uh, the test environment will remain around forever. Um, and the idea of that is, of course, to encourage RegTex to be able to develop their own systems, their own platforms to integrate in with it, with our system. And look, um, as uh, look, Deb mentioned before, Melisan alluded to as well, this is part of APRA seeing, but RegTex are a very important part of the regulatory reporting ecosystem. Okay, so for how this can happen, um, we outline the steps here, but this is where I will emphasize that all this information is up on the APRA website. But briefly, what happens is that we invite RegTex to email into APRA. Um, there's a email address that we'll give at the end. Um, we then go through a deed of access type of process, which is pre pretty much where we ask you to um, identify yourself, um, outline what you're going to be doing with the system, um, and then go through and agree to the terms and conditions for use of the system. And then what we can do is provide access to that test environment system. Um, you'll see here, especially on the website, we go into more detail. Um, one of the um, quirks of the system is that uh, RegTex or all uh, users of the system have access to one industry area at a time, uh, but we can certainly take you through that uh, when we come to it. And certainly switching between the industry areas isn't, isn't a big deal. Uh, and we're willing to do that as many times as possible. Okay, so look, the, the, brief, uh, the brief summary of how to get access is by emailing into APRA, we go through a deed for access process, and then you'll be able to get access into the system. So hold on, on to the next slide, thanks. Okay, and this is really where, yeah, we'll just point out that there is additional information available on our website. Um, the magic, uh, I suppose, email addresses to know is, uh, the, um, to get information on the RegTech process, it's data analytics. So that's two A's in the middle between our data and analytics, um, but data analytics at apra.gov.au. And for more general questions about the project um, itself, you can email apraconnect at apra.gov.au. Okay, and uh, but certainly the other links that we show here are um, this is into things such as user guides, more information on the processes that people can go through, and look more information on the project as well. Okay, so um, that's what we wanted to share this afternoon. Um, hopefully that makes some sense, um, but I, I think just to go back over it again, it is that APRA has a new data collection platform which we're rolling out, um, and we would love RegTex to be um, a, a part of that. Um, it, of course, uh, if you're wanting, and if that fits in with your business plans as well. Okay, so I'll certainly pause there, um, and Deborah, are we doing questions now, or do we want to leave them until the end of the session? Uh, have, I, have I caught Deb out? <laughs> Hi, yes. Hey, I I think... Questions. Yeah, yeah. I'll take any questions while we're waiting for yes. Deb to return. Yeah, right, so I, can... I think oh, sorry. Uh, yep. this is Hong speaking. Oh, and hi, hi. I think we'll be taking questions right at the end of all the presentations. So if we could just move on now to Corbis. Great. Sounds good. Okay, Kylie, I think you're first, though. Kylie Rickson, I can see your hand up. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the uh, the button disappeared for the unmute. Um, welcome, James. Thank you very much. Thanks, Devin. Thanks, Doug. Uh, look, as a former financial controller of a bank insurance company, uh, the changes that APRA are making uh, are very much welcome from industry and from red tech providers. So uh, it's great to see. Uh, just as a quick introduction, so my name is James. I work for Cortel. Uh, Cortel is an Australian and New Zealand based company. Uh, we specialize in analytics um, and we've applied that analytic lens and expertise in financial services to uh, set up some reg tech products. 
Uh, we've recently won global awards for uh, basically for SaaS based deployments and for our analytic capabilities. Um, but the primary application I'm going to speak to today is called Core Biz, and it uh, covers app reporting. Uh, I'm going to speak to a specific case study of Bank Australia. Hong, if you can flick through, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, so look, it could be any one of our clients, to be honest. Most of our clients have the same issues, the same challenges when it comes to regulatory reporting and governance. Uh, the original challenges are that every organization's got uh, disparate systems. They've all got core banking systems, treasury systems, credit, loan originations, etc. And consolidating all of those disparate data sources into a workable model for production of the reports and the forms takes time. It's a manually intensive process. Uh, there's audit risks, there's control, uh, manual controls in place, um, and change management. So APRA in Australia has gone through a number of changes over the years. Uh, we've gone through EFS in the banking space. We're in APRA Connect at the moment. Um, of course, with banking, we've got credit reforms coming through, capital reforms in the super space. We've got the transformation program. So look, the the way the the change is just uh, normal these days, and as as a uh, the rate of change is not slowing down effectively. Uh, but what is important is the weight of risk is actually increasing, and that's seen through the likes of BEAR. Um, so for those overseas, it's where there's executive accountability now um, for meeting compliance requirements. Um, and we also had the Royal Commission, of course. So the fallout from the Royal Commission and the enforceable undertaking some APRA are really driving execs to now challenge the concept of, okay, we've done this process for years, it's been manually based, um, there's too much risk attached to it. The weight of risk is increasing, so we need to address this in a more meaningful fashion. And that's where the reg tech opportunities come in, and that's what most of our clients approach us for. So with Bank Australia, they had those key requirements. Uh, we started working with them on automating through the deployment of Corbis. We started modeling their data. Uh, once we'd set uh, Corbis up and Corbis has got a, a proprietary, unique proprietary engine in it, which uh, applies a lot of smart to bring in data, um, empower end users to actually do the mapping of data. Um, and it also facilitates a lot of the drill through capabilities uh, that end users want. Uh, I know from my former life, um, consolidating data from disparate sources and then actually trying to investigate data is very painful, um, very time consuming and prone to error. So being able to navigate through from an end state report through to the underlying data sources and tap into the source system data uh, is very powerful. Uh, and that's where the analytics capability of the Corbis platform comes in. Um, with that deep dive analysis, we uh, allowed Bank Australia to sort of commentary capture. So to be able to meet their executive um, uh, questions, APRA questions, provide insights on the data, and it just streamlined the compliance requirements was also important to note was it streamlined a lot of the IT requirements because the data piece of work is is the time consuming piece for any organization and Corb is facilitated a much more streamlined data preparation uh, so much so that we were actually up and running within Bank Australia within a matter of weeks we don't take months and months and months uh, the application is very readily deployed uh, and quick to realize value um, so like all our other clients, Bank Australia started using the application, they started to draw value from it, and then they started to leverage the actual power of the application. Uh, so we've got automatic um, board reporting. So out of the box board reporting, uh, we have uh, executive reports. So we actually ingest all the published data that APRA and the RBA uh, released to market, and we combine that with client data. And this is a really important point to note on any business case value proposition. Um, it's not just compliance overhead. The granularity of the data that's required for app reporting is very rich. Um, so actually turning that into a value add component for the business just makes sense. And it's really important to note that you've got a governed data set. So once you're approving data, to actually reuse that data just makes absolute sense. So the whole reg tech initiative um, really needs to, in the reporting space, really needs to draw out the analytical capabilities and having an integrated data uh, model uh, that can be used for all manner of reporting. Uh, and that's what we're doing now with regards uh, 
Thank you, Shirley. We're automating the ASIC annual reporting. So there's a big initiative on in Australia at the moment to look at digitising the annual accounting process, so your WSBs and your IFRS. Um, so we're actually doing that with Bank Australia on extending core biz to leverage that data asset and deliver the reporting outputs. We're also taking part, uh, taking care of the transition to AfriConnect. Uh, so as I said before, it's a really welcome change. Uh, the significant benefits that are going to be realised for our clients, um, stuff like validation commentary, which can be automatically submitted through the AfriConnect as opposed to traditionally typing in the, the commentary into D2A. And we're also embedding capital forecasting and stress testing. And the, tr the, the transition to AfriConnect is taken uh, care of by Cortel as part of our subscription-based model. So for our clients and Bank Australia, um, there's no real work for these guys. We're taking care of that transition for them. Uh, on top of that, we're actually starting to, which is really exciting for myself, we're starting to introduce a lot more augmented intelligence. Um, so as I said, there's a lot of granular data uh, in, the, in the data requirements for APRA. Uh, and using the core capabilities in the underlying platform and applying some smarts using the augmented intelligence to really supplement what the expertise uh, in-house, so the regulatory knowledge that companies have in-house, but augmenting that with the capabilities of the underlying application. So we've got machine-based learning and taken away from a, a lot of augmented intelligence chatbots for uh, on the commercial side. So when you engage with a website, you get chatbots. Um, but really applying that from a compliance perspective is really exciting and cutting edge with where the capabilities of RegTech and Corvus specifically is going. So it's an exciting time to really draw insights into the compliance, but insights into the business as well. Now we're adding in the predictive forecasting as well. So all of a sudden you get this one-stop shop for uh, your app reporting, so your core credential reporting, your ASIC reporting, your capital forecasting, your tax reporting. Uh, so it's really exciting in terms of what can actually be done with this data. And at the end of the day, it all delivers better outcomes. So um, we have a, a, a phrase, it's regulatory conformance and corporate performance. So it is a compliance overhead getting your app reporting done. So you want to do it as seamlessly as possible with the rigour and the governance that's required. Um, but you want to draw value out of the process. So when you're actually doing your business case to your CFO or to your CRO or to your CTO, what's the value that this is going to drive besides regulatory compliance? And there's a lot, a lot of value that can be drawn, but from the data asset with the right application over the top. Ultimately, it reduces risk. So from an executive perspective, that's great from a fair and a far accountability. Uh, and it just greatly enhances the governance and controls streamlines what is traditionally quite a manual based audit process uh, for the regulatory audits under the 310 audits. So we can actually streamline a lot of those processes. Uh, so this is the journey we're on with Bank Australia amongst many other clients. Actually, Holm, do you mind just flicking through to the next slide for me, please? These are just some of our clients that we're working with uh, in the Australian based markets. So it's exciting times for us as a reg tech provider. It's exciting times for our clients as they're starting to really see the value uh, that RegTech can provide, not just in the compliance side of things, but in the performance of their business. Uh, happy to take questions at the end, and obviously share any information uh, that you'd like. Thank you, Hong. Thank you very much, James. Appreciate that. Um, okay, if I could uh, now invite uh, Joanne Horgan from Visor, who's beaming in all the way from uh, Dublin, uh, which is out tonight, and her this morning. Good morning, Joanne. Morning, Deborah. Thank, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, good morning and good afternoon to everybody on the line. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Joanne Horgan from Visor. Um, and if, for those of you who don't know who Visor is, uh, Visor is the um, it's a globe the global leader basically in the provision of supervisor technology uh, for data collection. So we work with over twenty five regulators around the world, um, and and we're the solution provider that's worked with APRA um, with with Doug and his team to build APRA Connect or over the last. Um, the last two years. So um, just to give a little bit of an introduction, we've we've been in business for about 20 years. We've helped regulators move from sort of quarterly reports via you know Excel um, to, to XBRL um, to now what we see you know collecting granular loan level data via API. Um, and we really see the volume and frequency of data ever increasing. 
Um, our, our subtech portal that we have in place with, the, with those 25 regulators um, is used by, by over 30,000 financial institutions to submit financial risk and tax data to their regulators or tax authorities. Um, and we see we see a similar trend. You know, we see uh, most regulators are moving to collection of more granular data. Um, they're moving to digitalization of the regulatory reporting process, um, and some even moving to um, you know the 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 API pull and push of data between uh, regulated institutions and regulators. And really, what that means, I think, for for us and for the industry is, um, you know, you really need to have. Uh, a technolo technology solution for, for regulatory reporting, one that can keep up with the pace of that change. Um, and similar to Deborah, Deborah mentioned sort of subtech and regtech, um, and subtech being supervisory technology and, and regtech being regulatory technology as, as two sides of the same coin. So, um, you know, I do see them as, as slightly different use cases, but a lot of the technology that's used is the same. It's just being applied, you know, one to help supervisors um, with, with data collection or analytics. Um, and on the on the industry side, RegTech helping with um, you know regulatory reporting and compliance and, and various um, various regulatory uh, requirements. Um, and I think what you know what we're seeing as as we move forward, um, you know, having come from that that subtech background, um, the reason we started looking at at RegTech, I suppose, and started looking at well, what are the challenges that financial institutions face. Um, is because we, we kind of see a huge inefficiency today um, in, in the whole regulatory reporting life cycle. Um, and what we saw was, you know, Visor was helping regulators to try to collect um, better data, um, to, to get better quality data so that they could um, increase the efficiency of, of supervision and get better insights on the market, etc. Um, but we, you know, without looking at the, the challenges that financial institutions face with that, we're sort of missing half the problem. And what we see in the future is is really, um, you know, providing that the next generation of subtech and regtech um, connectivity. So so really looking at how we can have, um, you know, supervisors and um, regulated institutions, um, if if not sharing the same technology, at least having technology that is able to talk to, to each other, um, you know, via API or others and having more clearly defined data models as well um, that that's one of the key things that we think will help reduce the burden um, for financial institutions uh, next slide please hon okay so if we look at some of the the challenges that um that we still see in the regulatory reporting life cycle um and these are challenges i think you know mostly for for financial institutions but also for, for regulators in some cases so the increase in data um We've seen a, a huge explosion in, in the last um, two years, I would say, in, in terms of the, the granularity and frequency of data requests from regulators. Um, uh, you know, where typically, you know, maybe maybe five years ago, we would have seen quarterly changes to, to regular requirements. We're, we're now seeing um, one of our customers, for example, in, in the Bank of England, they're doing two week sprints. Um, now they're not putting them live every two weeks, but they've now moved to a much more agile way of, of uh, updating their, their data requirements. Um, and regulatory data collection is really moving towards all, all the Vs of big data. I don't know how many there are now that could start out with four and now there's five or six, but you know, the volume, sort of sort of the, the amount of data that, that regulators need, that the variety of data, um, the, the velocity or frequency of, of that data, the quality and, and um veracity of that data. Um that's really important. And and the last one, I think, there, the value. So that's also something that regulators um are becoming much more um aware of. So you know, the, the value of the data that they're collecting, are they using it um, correctly? Are they making it clear to the industry why why they're collecting that data, et cetera? Um, and that's something that's uh, that, that's definitely a change that we've seen just over the last couple of years. I think that recognition from both um, from both regulators and the industry that, you know, manual data processes just don't scale anymore. Um, you know, it, it, you can't just go online or go into an application and, and type in the data or um, you know, upload it via Excel and and um, and leave it at that. You really need um, you know, really need a data process that's going to be auditable, that's going to be um, automated as much as possible, um, and and that's going to ensure the, the the security and the quality of the data the whole way through. Um, another um, another challenge that we we still see, and and I'm not sure this has gone away completely, um, but interpretation. So. One of the key challenges, I think, for for regulated entities is, um, you know, getting a very clear understanding of of what's required and what the data requirements are. 
So, um, you know, there, there isn't necessarily a very good shared understanding of reporting requirements. Um, I think I think APRA have done a, a great job in terms of how they're publishing, um, you know, the, the, the various artifacts related to the, to the data model. There's a lot of information on the website um, related to APRA Connect. And I think that's really good to see. Um, you know, I think the more that that regulators can collaborate and communicate with the industry and with RegTex, um, it's going to make it's going to make the regulatory reporting interpretation a, a lot easier um, and hopefully reduce the amount of uh, misinterpretation that, that sometimes happens. Um, and then within within financial institutions, the complexity um, of, of legacy source systems means that, you know, it can be difficult to, to extract and find the data that's required. Um, and it can also be difficult then to um, to make changes when, when regulatory changes happen. Um, really, in the future, what, what we see, you know, if you move towards more granular data and data that is more um, more aligned and more closely aligned with the, the operational data within a financial institution, um, the amount of changes required sh should reduce over time as well. Um, so I think I think that's the direction of travel. Um, but I think it also points to the fact that sort of tactical or point solutions um, they're becoming too expensive to maintain. So, you know, where we, we, we've seen examples where somebody might have uh, literally coded up, you know, in, in SQL, for example, um, their their ETL or their extraction of data, the, the rules that they run, um, you know, it's not well documented. It's it's really difficult to maintain something like that. Um, or they try to interpret the rules that the regulator has has published. Um, and again, you know, they misinterpret them or they write the wrong rules and it means they're submitting um, poor quality data. Um, so I think they're the, the sort of key challenges. We see these in, in Australia, but we see them across multiple jurisdictions. Um, next slide, please, Hong. Um, so, so Visor, as I mentioned, you know, we've we started with this on subtech. We started with subtech solutions for regulators. Um, we've moved into looking at how we can help um, the financial institutions and reg tech providers as well. Um, to, to, to leverage, I think, some of that, uh, you know, some of the technology that we've provided to regulators. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the things that I think makes, you know, makes a lot of sense is, is to have, um, you know, to have that publication of, from regulators of the, the regulatory requirements, the regulatory data models, the rules in, in a, in a machine readable way. Um, so whether that's um, in XML or maybe in future, you know, it might be accessible via API, for example. Um, that allows reg tech providers like like Visor to keep um, in sync with regulators reporting requirements and changes over time. Um, you know, the other thing in, in, in the solution that we provide, you know, we, we can run all of the rules, obviously, that the regulator publishes. We can consume those once, once they're published. Um, so firms can really guarantee that they're going to get their submissions right first time. They can pre-validate their, their data before they submit. Um, I think one of the great things with with APRA Connect is the the test environment that's available, as as Doug mentioned. Um, you know that's going to give firms and and reg tech providers uh, an early view of of regulatory requirements um, of the system of how rules are run, for example. Um, and that'll be really good in terms of getting your your systems up to date um, and keeping them up to date. But I think. Um, you know, firms also need to make sure that even before they get into the the, the APRA environment, that they have really good um, data governance, data management, um, and validation of data before they're um, even putting it into the the uh, APRA Connect system. Um, you know, cost is something that uh, you know I I didn't mention it there in the previous slide, but cost is is a huge issue. Um, and I think you know what we're seeing is leveraging the same. Um, you know, le leveraging the same sort of technology and, and rules that the regulator is publishing, we're, we're eliminating um, a duplication of efforts. So we're, we're, we're naturally reducing the costs of resources um, and also eliminating some of the risk uh, associated with erroneous or incomplete filings, um, which, which are significant in, in Australia. Um, the other thing, you know, I think that's really important is that any, any solution that you're looking at, you know, a lot of firms already maybe have solutions in place. For regulatory reporting or data governance, et cetera, or data, data management. Um, and we provide a solution that it can, it can integrate easily with existing systems via API. So it's not sort of brain surgery for your organization. You don't have to rip out everything that you've got already. Um, you know, we're very much we're very much sort of looking at um how we can help an organization to get ready for, for APRA Connect and um, to get ready for the, the the changes that that are coming in terms of granular data, et cetera. Um, but you know, keeping in mind that some organisations have already invested quite a lot in in regulatory reporting processes, etc. Okay, next slide, please. 
Thanks. So in terms of the solution, um, I mean, I think this this is a uh, sort of a, a, a global solution. I think Deborah mentioned that as well. The, these these challenges and how regulatory reporting works um, is, is quite consistent uh, across the world. Um, you know, we see um, still a lot of legacy systems, um, still a lot of spreadsheets being used. Um, and and you know really a, a consistent sort of process for for reporting from data sourcing and transformation and preparation um into data validation and report submission into the regulator um what visor is providing is um you know we provide a any api that can consume data validated against the apra rules um and then convert the data into the the format required so if you have data just in in excel for example and um, we can take that in, uh, validate it and produce the, the required, um, you know, the required format for submission to APRA Connect. And, um, you know, also what's important is keeping in, in sync with data models and rules as they're published by the regulator. Um, I think, you know, what we're looking at here and, and, and James mentioned this as well, I think it is really important to, to move beyond just the, you know, the initial um, the initial compliance uh, of just getting your data into APRA Connect, for example. Um, but I think for a lot of people, when when there's new technology or when there's a new reporting requirement, that's always the first challenge is to to get your data ready and get it submitted. Um, but it's important that it's in a in a format and in a granular data format that is useful then for for uh, further reporting afterwards. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so just have sort of two two small case studies here or two small examples. Um, in uh, 2019, uh, Visor worked with the, the Monetary Authority of Singapore to develop their data collection gateway um, for the collection of MAS 610. Um, in November that year, we, we launched regulatory reporting solutions in Singapore. And soon after that, we partnered with, with Walters Clure to assist um, their customers in, in uh, preparation and getting ready for, for MAS 610. Um, we deployed that the solution for, for 30 customers with Walters Clure in, in uh, over six months in, in April, um, from April to um, later in 2020. Um, and, you know, one of the one of the key things there in, in uh, Singapore was making sure that the, you know, the rules and the, the data model that was being provided um, for, for Mass 610 was available for all of the industry. Um, so it's published again on their website. Um, it's you know it's been refined so we took sort of very large data collection redefined it in a uh, a sensible way i would say in terms of d dimensions and metrics um, and also made sure that any calculations that need to be run are, are run on that data as well prior to submission um next slide please okay um in australia um you know similar to to our approach in singapore we're, you know we're really key to work with you know existing reg techs um, we're working at the moment with Silvexia, who are another member of the reg tech association um and what we're doing there is we're working with them for um again for, for validation and production of the the, the regulatory um the, the regulatory reports for apra connect so um you know we have an API enabled reg tech subtech platform. We have all of the APRA Connect reports and rules available and up to date and um, provide full validation of uh, and audit trail of any data and data adjustments that happen. Um, we transform data to the D2A or APRA Connect format as required um, and we can provide direct submission to APRA Connect via, via API once it's uh, once it's available. Um, I think working with, you know, one, one of the things that's really important in, in, in RegTech, I think, and the RegTech Association is collaboration. And, um, you know, unlike, I, I think maybe some um, some industries I do see that, uh, or some jurisdictions even, I think in Australia, there's a really good collaborative um, network. And, you know, Visor is very keen to work with existing RegTechs um, and to work directly with financial institutions uh, to, to help lower the burden of regulatory reporting. Um, and I think that's that's something that we've always been very keen on. Um, you know, we're very keen to make sure that uh, what we do with regulators is is open, is, you know, published, is communicated clearly. Um, and similarly, then, that we can help RegTechs and financial institutions uh, by, by providing, you know, the same benefits that we provide to uh, supervisors. OK, so I think we're out of time. We need some time for Q&A. So uh, thank you very much, Hong. And if anybody wants to get in touch, please feel free to reach out. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you very much. Um, so I just want to make the call out to um, the team from APRA and there, Carly uh, Rickson has put her hand up. Carly, 
would you like to turn your camera and mic on to address the APRA team uh, directly? Can I have Malisand, Pats and uh, Doug back to the virtual podium? There we are. Uh, hi, guys. Um, thanks for the presentations. It's, it is very exciting stuff. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities here as we, you know, as we're exchanging more and more data between regulators and licensees. Um, I, I just a question for Doug um, and then maybe James um, as well. So, Doug, do I understand that um, APRA are or aren't API enabling the um, new APRA Connect platform? And then I just wondered sort of from Joanne and James, what's the additional sort of uplift and value that you get from that direct um, API enablement versus having to sort of convert it and then um, upload it? And obviously we're sort of dealing with other regimes like the ASIC, the new ASIC breach reporting regime as well, which is currently day one looking like a manual um, upload solution, which isn't even batched. Um, but they're also sort of thinking through solutions on their side for um, API enablement or some other um, bulk upload. Okay, so Kylie, thanks for the question. Um, so the answer from the APRA Connect perspective is a definite yes. We are um, API enabling the system. Now we'll say that's still a work in progress, so it's not available yet in the test system. Uh, we certainly still intend though to make it available this year. Um, what I will say is that, yeah, we're certainly just concentrating on making sure that the collections are working themselves. Um, and what we're finding certainly is the entities and the reg techs that we're already working with, um, you're they're getting used to the format for what sort of data needs to go in what, what field and things like that. So, but the answer is definitely yes, we still do intend to API, API enable APRA Connect. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll just answer in terms of, you know, how we think that helps the, the industry. Um, so, you know, if, if you think about um, the frequency and, and volume of data reporting increasing, if you imagine um, a regulator looking for, uh, and I'm not saying APRA is doing this now, but if you, if you imagine a regulator that starts to look for more frequent reports, so maybe weekly, maybe even daily, um, it would be quite a quite a pain to have to log on every day or every week and, and submit and upload data manually. So I think where, where we see the, the API connectivity um, helping is, is really where we have um, data that's going to be more frequent and more granular. Um, it, it reduces the risk of manual error. It reduces the risk of, um, or I guess even the, the cost of sort of manual processes as well. Um, and I think as we, you know, for us, as we look at our, our subtech platform, we're looking at, you know, yes, submission is one area that we can we can enable via API, but I think there's other areas such as making, making the data models and rules available. Um, there's lots of areas around, you know, queries going back and forth potentially. So I, I really see that, you know, for, for regtechs, um, making, you know, having having a subtech platform that's API enabled will really um, allow regtechs to, to develop their solutions and to have more automation in the process and, and less risk of error. Thanks very much. Um, great question. Um, there's another question here for APRA. Uh, does APRA plan to start collecting cyber related information through APRA Connect? And if so, when will this be focused on regulated entities or might APRA engage with systemically important service providers to question mark? Okay, yeah, thanks for the question. I'll, so I'll provide a general answer first of all, um, and that is for all new collections, um, the intention is to put them onto APRA Connect, so onto the new platform. So that is whenever APRA does any type of new collection, it will go onto the APRA Connect platform. Then when it comes down to the timings and the roadmap for the collections, um, look, I know that some of the, some of my colleagues are answering some of the specific questions in the conversation, um, but look, yes, yeah, certainly today we're not in a position to be able to outline a complete roadmap of um, what are what are the new collections that are coming up. Um, but look, and that's mainly because APRA will continue to um, publicise that uh, on the website and also um, in terms of subscription email addresses uh, as those new collections are coming up. Um, but look, certainly our intention is always to provide enough um, time. Uh, but also to make sure that we engage uh, with entities, reg techs, the whole ecosystem as we're introducing new collections. I might just um, add to that. Um, I'm not sure the, the specific answer to the question, but we are doing an awful lot of work in cyber at the moment. And as a general proposition, when we do start to look at an area, we're better off looking at it at it for a while before we start 
and put in place a formal regular collection of, of, of data so that we make sure that we really know what it is we want to collect if we are going to put in place something for the longer term. So I don't know the, the specific answer about whether there will be some cyber related um, data required over the next little while, but we are doing a lot of work in that area. We're working very collaboratively with industry because this is another area where it's a win-win-win for industry and APRA and the whole community if we get it right. Um, there's another question here quickly for Doug. We, we, we're kind of running out of time, but I'll ask you this one quickly, Doug. Do you have indicative timings for GI into APRA Connect from a reporting perspective? Okay, I think uh, Jane's answered that question. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, great. In the chat, I think, yep. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So She's onto it. So. She's yeah. on to it. Um, then there were some questions, some quick questions for Joanne. If I can ask you both and you can wrap them up into one answer, that'd be awesome. I'm just trying to find them now. Um, there was a question in relation to someone saying they weren't that, oh, not being too familiar with Visor software architecture, I'm curious to understand how globally it is handling the growing movement of data. Um, I'm sorry, my question just jumped away. Uh, the growing movement of data. Oh, okay. Can yeah, you see it? I, yeah, I can see it there. Yeah, so, so I guess, um, so maybe maybe just to explain, um, when we work with regulators typically today, um, the, the, the data is housed uh, by the regulator, it's installed uh, either on premise or in, you know, it can be in a, a, a private cloud or or um, cloud architecture. But um, the data is stored by the regulator, owned by the regulator, etc. Um, in terms of of data exchange, um, you know, we we do work. We've spoken about subtech today. We do work on the in the AUI space, which is uh, exchange of automatic exchange of information for for tax transparency purposes. Um, and that works really well. Um, data is exchanged across borders in, in that case, um, uh, but it's exchanged it, it exchanged through uh, the OECD. So the OECD provide a, a common transmission system. All data is encrypted and it's it's sent and received by countries um, and, and Visor provides solutions for tax authorities for that. So, um, you know, at the moment, data sovereignty is, is really handled through, um, through where it resides and where it's owned uh, by the regulator typically. Um, and where data can cross borders, um, you know, we really see that there there is a need for a um, an honest broker, if you like, in, in the middle. And uh, in the tax world, the OECD provides that. Oh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so I might um, we uh, have gone a little bit over time, and I'm just conscious of that. So we might need to wrap up. But what I thought I might do is start with you, James. Um, can you give us like a 10 second parting uh, comment? Um, we've still got um, uh, nearly 90 people on the line right now. So what, what do you have to say? Uh, as I said, the regulatory performance and corporate performance is not just a cost based uh, application. It can be used for driving top line growth as well. Thanks, James. Uh, Joanne? Sorry, music. Could you repeat that, Deb? Sorry. Oh, I just uh, wanted a 10 second parting comment from you oh, before we wrap up. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, so I think, um, um, you know, get 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 ready for Apra Connect. I think, you know, use the the data that's available and all of the information that's available on Apra's website. And I would say, yes, you know, st start thinking. If you haven't started thinking about it already, then I would say st start thinking about automating your your ready to reporting process. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Melisande? Nothing specific to add other than uh, continued thanks for all the work in this area and an encouragement of people to really look into it and see how they can get on board. Great, thanks. Uh, Doug, final word to you. Oh, thanks very much. I'd just say, look, APRA, I think, continues to, or I'm sure, looks forward to continuing to work with RegTechs, and the APRA Connect system is hopefully a really good indication of that, giving access to the test environment on an ongoing basis. And we look, look forward to continuing to develop that um, in conjunction with the whole RegTech ecosystem as well. So thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, and thank uh, thank you very much to our speakers today. It's so great to see that uh, the association um, is so well aligned with um, with APRA's um, 
uh, core mission as well. Uh, but what I heard there was uh, it the reg tech can be a win for regulators, for reg techs, for reg entities and uh, for consumers. So I wanted to thank you all very much. Um, there is a poll there. If you're still online, please uh, do complete that. Thanks for your time. We have recorded the session. It will be made available um, following this event. If we've got members on the line here today and you didn't fill in the survey that I sent you uh, about a week or so ago, I would really, really value your completion of that survey. Having this industry data, and we've been talking about data today, having that industry data is really critical for us. It will take only about five minutes. Please complete that. Um, the previous slide showed all the great new programs that we've got underway. Uh, but finally, just before uh, we sign off, and as I said, I will stay on for a few minutes if people want to chat. Um, I wanted to thank Alison and Hong, who work very, very hard behind the scenes to make these events happen and have them run so seamlessly. Um, please don't forget to reach out to them if you'd like to discuss membership or how you can um, maximise the membership that you have with us. Um, thank you very much for attending. And as I said, I'll, I'll stay online now for a little while. Thanks all. Um, we can um, stop the recording now. Thanks.